Hello, I'm Professor Peraza, and today's lecture video covers macronutrients, and we will be discussing carbohydrates. These are the specific learning objectives for this module. After this lecture, you'll be able to identify the functions of the energy-yielding macronutrients, list examples of food sources for the energy-yielding macronutrients, describe the dietary recommendations for the energy-yielding macronutrients, summarize how macronutrients are digested and metabolized in the body, and explain how dietary approaches can treat and manage chronic lifestyle diseases. This module also meets the following course learning objectives. Before we get into lecture, I want you to think of the following energy yielding macronutrients, carbohydrates, lipids, or proteins. Which do you think is the most important? And this is something I hope you'll be able to confidently answer after this section. Carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They include sugars, starches, and fiber. Some foods that contain carbohydrates are fruits, vegetables in higher amounts, and starchy vegetables like peas, grains, and dairy. Let's talk about simple sugars, which includes monosaccharides and disaccharides. Monosaccharides or single sugars include glucose, which is often called blood sugar, fructose, which is found in fruits, vegetables, honey, and high fructose corn syrup, and galactose, which is primarily found in milk and dairy products. Glucose is an important energy source, especially for the brain and nervous system. Glucose is found in fruits, vegetables, honey, corn syrup, and high fructose corn syrup. Galactose is almost always found linked to glucose as a disaccharide and rarely in the monosaccharide form in our food supply. Disaccharides or double sugars include lactose, maltose, and sucrose. Lactose is made up of glucose and galactose. Sucrose, which is made by crystallizing sugarcane or beet juice, is made up of glucose and fructose. Maltose is made up of glucose and glucose. It doesn't occur naturally in any appreciable amount in foods, with one exception, sprouted grains. When grains sprout, they break down starch and create maltose. Let's review the complex carbohydrates, which include oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. The oligosaccharides include raffinose and stachyose, and you could find these in onions, cabbage, whole wheat products, and legumes. These oligosaccharides pass largely undigested into the large intestine, where bacteria metabolize them and produce intestinal gas and other byproducts. The polysaccharides include starch, which is digestible. Starch is a mixture of amylose and amylopectin. Sources include tubers, potatoes, rice, beans, and pasta. Refined starch, like cornstarch, is often used as an ingredient in processed foods as a thickener. Glycogen is another example of a polysaccharide, and this is the storage form of carbohydrates in humans and animals. The primary storage site for glycogen is the liver and also the muscle cells. The liver breaks down glycogen to keep our blood glucose levels stable, and muscle glycogen provides muscles with glucose. Together, liver, liver and muscle glycogen can provide enough glucose to last about 24 hours if you were to be fasting or on a low-carb diet. Fiber is the last example of a polysaccharide we're going to cover. Fiber is largely indigestible and will pass into the large intestine where bacteria metabolize and form short-chain fatty acids and gas. Short-chain fatty acids provide fuel for cells in the large intestine. Fiber is indigestible because we lack the enzymes to break it down. Total fiber includes dietary fiber that occurs naturally in plants and functional fiber, which includes isolated or synthetic fibers that may be added to foods or be used as a supplement. Functional fibers can be isolated or extracted from a natural plant source or manufactured. Many foods have a combination of soluble and insoluble fibers. An apple, for example, has insoluble fiber, cellulose, in the outer skin, and soluble fiber in the inner cells, pectin, gums, mucilages. Soluble fibers dissolve easily in water and gel together. Soluble fibers are found in oat bran and the flesh of fruits and berries and psyllium. Soluble fibers have been shown to reduce blood cholesterol levels and decrease glucose levels. Soluble fiber helps to bind to cholesterol and bile acids, which reduces circulating cholesterol levels. Types of soluble fibers include pectins and gums. Insoluble fibers do not dissolve in water and can be found in seeds and whole grains. 
Insoluble fiber can be found in celery, legumes, and the skin of fruits and vegetables. Insoluble fiber has been shown to reduce the risk of constipation by creating a softer, bulkier stool and also aid in decreasing transit time. Linean cellulose and hemocellulose are common types of insoluble fibers. Benefits of fiber include reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and cancer, the esophagus, stomach, colon, and breast. The recommendation for fiber is set at 14 grams per 1,000 calories for those over the age of 1. Although fiber is beneficial, too much could be a concern, especially if consuming a low-fluid diet, as this can lead to constipation. Generally, this is not a concern unless fiber intake is over about 50 to 60 grams per day. This can also be a concern for young children if not getting adequate amounts of calories. Let's review whole grains versus refined. Before harvesting, all grains are whole, meaning they contain the entire seed or kernel of the plant. There are three edible parts, the bran, germ, and the endosperm. There's also an inedible husk that protects the seed. Examples of whole grains include whole wheat, corn, including popcorn, brown rice, oats, and rye. When a food is refined, this means the outer bran layer is removed along with the germ. The bran contains antioxidants, B vitamins, and fiber. The germ, which is the embryo of the seed, contains B vitamins, protein, zinc, magnesium, and healthy fats. What remains is the endosperm, which is mostly starch and a small amount of protein, vitamins, and minerals. Grain products can be enriched, which means some of the missing nutrients are added back in. This includes thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, iron, and folic acid. Labeling terms can get confusing, so let's talk about whole wheat versus whole grain. Whole wheat is simply one kind of whole grain. One way to tell if a product is 100% whole grain is to look for the 100% stamp from the Whole Grains Council. This means that all grains ingredients are whole grain. You can also look at the ingredient list on the Nutrition Facts panel. Look for 100% whole wheat or whole grain versus enriched wheat flour or white flour. One thing I want to point out with whole grain products is that the recommendations from the dietary guidelines are to consume at least half of your grains as whole grains. This doesn't mean that you can't eat products like white rice, which is a staple in many cultures. The important thing is to look at your intake for the day. Let's review carbohydrate recommendations. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2020 to 2025 suggests the following. 45 to 65% of calories from carbohydrates, 130 grams of digestible carbohydrates for the RDA, 14 grams per 1,000 calories of dietary fiber, and no more than 10% of calories from added sugars per day. The emphasis with carbohydrates is on whole, minimally processed foods like fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Added sugars include those who are added during food manufacturing and do not include naturally occurring sugars. Maple syrup and honey are considered added sugars as they are single ingredient and added to food. According to the dietary guidelines, the top sources of added sugar in Americans' diets are sugar-sweetened beverages, largely soda, followed by desserts and sweet snacks like cookies and brownies. Now, the American Heart Association has some more strict guidelines as it relates to added sugar intake. They recommend limiting added sugars to no more than 6% of calories. Their upper limit is also set at 6 teaspoons for women and 9 teaspoons for men. Let's review the functions of carbohydrates. Digestible carbohydrates are primary energy source as the central nervous system and red blood cells derive almost all of their energy from glucose. If you don't consume enough carbohydrates, your body can enter a state of ketosis. Without enough carbohydrates, your body needs to obtain that glucose from somewhere, so it will write down amino acids in muscles and other organs to make glucose. Protein, which we will cover later in this course, has many other vital functions in the body. With fiber-rich carbohydrates, there's a lot of research on the connection with preventing constipation and reducing the risk of chronic diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Soluble fiber in particular helps to reduce the absorption of cholesterol. We covered digestion previously, but let's take a closer look at carbohydrate digestion and absorption. When you chew, you are aiding in the breakdown of carbohydrates with mechanical digestion. Salivary amylase in your saliva helps to break down starch into polysaccharides and disaccharides. 
In the stomach, salivary amylase is inactivated and digestion of carbohydrate mostly stops until the small intestine. The small intestine is primarily where digestion of carbohydrates takes place as pancreatic amylase and dextrinase work to break down polysaccharides into oligosaccharides. Disaccharides are digested by enzymes in the absorptive cells of the small intestine. Monosaccharides do not need further breakdown in the small intestine. By the end of this process, enzymatic digestion, we're left with three monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, and galactose. Fructose and galactose are converted to glucose in the liver. Once absorbed, carbohydrates pass through the liver. Glucose is the main form of carbohydrate circulating in the bloodstream. Any excess glucose will either be stored as glycogen in the liver or converted to body fat. Any indigestible carbohydrates will pass into the large intestine where they are fermented by bacteria into acids and gas or excreted. Fermentation produces short chain fatty acids, which our large intestine cells can use as an energy source. Let's talk about glucose regulation in the body. After a meal with carbohydrates, blood glucose levels will rise. Your pancreas will release insulin, which helps to transport glucose into the cells to use for energy and also store glucose as glycogen. Insulin is a hormone made by the beta cells of the pancreas. As a result, blood glucose levels return to normal, which is typically between 70 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. If we need glucose right away for energy, we can metabolize glucose through cellular respiration. If we don't need this energy right away, it is stored as glycogen or converted to fat. When you're between meals, your blood glucose levels will fall. Your pancreas releases glucagon, which leads to the breakdown of glycogen to glucose and also increases gluconeogenesis. Glucagon is made by the alpha cells of the pancreas. We can use amino acids to make glucose via gluconeogenesis. This leads to blood glucose levels returning to normal. This glucose regulation is a key process in maintaining homeostasis, as blood glucose levels that are too low can cause cellular function to fail, especially in your brain, leading to seizures and coma. This is called hypoglycemia. Hyperglycemia, on the other hand, is when blood glucose levels get too high, and this can lead to damage to your cells. What I previously discussed with glucose regulation is in the absence of diabetes. We're going to discuss a few conditions, metabolic syndrome and diabetes. Metabolic syndrome is a group of conditions that can increase your risk of health problems like coronary heart disease, diabetes, and stroke. With metabolic syndrome, an individual must have at least three risk factors. Factors include abdominal obesity, which is typically a waist circumference greater than 35 inches for women or 40 inches for men, elevated blood pressure, which is typically over 130 for systolic and 80 for diastolic, elevated blood glucose, elevated triglycerides, which is above 150 milligrams per deciliter, and a low HDL. Let's talk about diabetes. There are two main forms of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. There's also gestational diabetes, which can occur during pregnancy. We will cover that later in this course. Type 1 diabetes can happen at any age, and with this condition, the pancreas does not produce any insulin or very little insulin. Type 1 diabetes is thought to be caused by an autoimmune reaction that destroys the beta cells in the pancreas. With type 1 diabetes, someone can feel fatigued and experience unintentional weight loss. Fasting blood glucose levels are also elevated, and ketones may be present in the urine. With type 2 diabetes, cells do not respond normally to insulin, which is called insulin resistance. Over time, your pancreas continues to pump out more insulin until eventually it cannot keep up, and this leads to type 2 diabetes. Those who have a family history of diabetes or if they have prediabetes or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, they're at higher risk of diabetes. With type 1 and type 2 diabetes, elevated blood sugar can lead to heart disease, vision loss, and kidney disease. Let's review testing for diabetes. A1C is one test that measures the average blood glucose level over three months. If your A1C is less than 5.7%, then this is normal. Between 5.7 and 6.4% is prediabetes, and greater than or equal to 6.5% is diabetes. This is typically the test used for diagnosis. Other tests that may be done include fasting blood glucose. Less than 100 mg per deciliter is normal, 100 to 125 indicates prediabetes, and greater than or equal to 126 indicates diabetes. 
Diabetes management includes many components, diet, exercise, regular testing, and medications if prescribed. We will cover the dietary portion next. However, one thing to point out is that having diabetes does not mean you're on a special diet with special foods. It's really just a balanced diet with regular consistent meals. Exercise is one strategy to help managing blood glucose levels as it improves the body's insulin response. One thing to keep in mind with diabetes and exercise is to always have a plan in place in the event blood sugar levels get too low. This means having quick glucose sources handy like gummies, juice, or glucose tabs. Having regular consistent meals can also help with avoiding blood glucose lows. Regular testing to increase awareness of blood glucose levels can also be helpful. Most physicians recommend six months or yearly labs to check A1C and fasting blood glucose levels. Medication may be needed to manage diabetes. For those with type 1 diabetes, insulin is necessary as the body does not produce any. For advanced type 2 diabetes, insulin may also be necessary, but in less severe cases, oral meds may be prescribed. Lastly, the care team. This can include an endocrinologist who specializes in diagnosing and treating health conditions relating to the endocrine system. This includes not just diabetes, but also thyroid diseases, infertility, and metabolic disorders. Let's talk about the American Diabetes Association plate method for those with diabetes. With the plate method, half the plate would be non-starchy vegetables, a quarter carbohydrates, and a quarter protein. Non-starchy vegetables are low in carbohydrates, high in vitamins and minerals, and fiber. With proteins, as with my plate, the goal is to emphasize those that are low in saturated fat and cholesterol. A variety of lean proteins that are plant and animal-based would be ideal. Carbohydrates are still included in the dietary plan for those with diabetes. With the carbohydrates, the idea is to include those that are higher in fiber, like whole grains, starchy vegetables, beans, legumes, and whole fruits. If you're wondering, fruit can still be incorporated for those with diabetes. The goal is to aim for whole fruits over juices, which contain more vitamins, minerals, and fiber. When meal planning with diabetes, healthy fats are also emphasized, along with water, or any unsweetened beverages.